honored to have our next guest, David Azerod, Dr. David Azerod. He runs the Norton, he runs the Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics, one of the great experts in the Constitution, how it applies uh, every day to your life. He's been, uh, ri he writes for the Times of London, for the National Review, for many prestigious organizations. Doctor. You just forgot to mention that the Simon Center is at the Heritage Foundation, which has been copacetic with the Tea Party since day one. Um, I, I gotta tell you, I, I travel all around the country giving talks and Tea Party audiences are without a doubt my favorite audiences to talk to. And I can't tell you how energizing it is to be here giving a talk to a Tea Party convention in 2016. Do you know what next month is? The seventh birthday of the Tea Party. So officially, the Tea Party started brewing in the last few years of the Bush administration with the orgy of spending we witnessed. After we got Medicare Part D, no child left behind, TARP. But when it formally crystallized was February 19th, 2009, the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Rick Santelli gives this fiery speech and all over the nation, these Tea Party groups start, start sprouting. Now I wanna take you back to that time do you remember how the elites reacted? Do you remember how the pundit class reacted? Do you remember what the politicians were saying? Let me take you to April, one month, a month and a half after the Tea Party starts. Nancy Pelosi says, this Tea Party initiative is funded by the high end. We call it AstroTurf. It's not really a grassroots movement. It's AstroTurf by some of the wealthiest people in America to keep the focus on tax cuts for the rich instead of the great middle class. That was the opening salvo in an endless barrage of malicious slurs, baseless accusations that were leveled from all corners of the country to discredit the Tea Party and deny its legitimacy. It wasn't just the politicians. Hollywood piled on it too. Morgan Freeman was on uh, Piers Morgan and said, the Tea Party's goal is to screw the country. We're gonna do whatever we can to get this black man out of here. It's a racist thing, he concluded. Well, then again, with liberalism, what exactly isn't a racist thing? And of course, if you wait long enough, you don't just get the accusations of racism, you get the accusations of Nazism. So Rod, um, Rob Reiner, who used to play Meathead in All in the Family, was on HBO's uh, Real Time with Bill Mayer, and he said, my fear is that the Tea Party gets a charismatic leader because all they're selling is fear and anger, and that's all that Hitler sold. Now hold on, I'm not done, because then the media came on board. At first, crickets, they ignored the Tea Party. Let's hope that if we don't talk about them, they're gonna go away. Well, that didn't work. So then they shifted gears. And then began the barrage of negative press coverage. Diane Sawyer described Tea Partiers as out of control marauders roaming Washington, some of them increasingly emotional, yelling slurs and epithets. CBC's Bob Schaefer accused demonstrators of hurling racial epithets and sexual slurs. And then, that still hadn't done the job, what did they do? They unleashed the IRS. 100%, every single Tea Party and conservative group between 2010 and 2012 that applied for nonprofit status was subjected to extra review by the IRS. Less than a third of progressive groups were. So the left pretty much did everything they could to crush and eradicate this grassroots movement. Now, you would think that liberals who are absolutely enamored with the people and grassroots activism would have celebrated what is undoubtedly one of the largest grassroots upswells in American history. It turns out with our liberal friends that they only like the people in the abstract. When they start talking to you guys, it turns out that you're a bit too religious, a bit too conservative. As President Barack Obama said, you cling to your guns and your religion to which I say, hell yeah, and I also cling to my constitution and my capitalism. Yeah. 
So the amazing thing for me, being here in 2016, they threw everything they had at it, and the Tea Party grew. In spite of all this adversity, today, about 20% of Americans identify with the Tea Party. Contrast with the Occupy Wall Street movement. Do you even remember the Occupy Wall Street movement? So in September, can you hear me if I move? Is, am I mic'd? Yes? No? Yes? OK. Contrast that, September 2011, a bunch of disheveled hipsters take over Zuccotti Park in Manhattan. Immediately, everyone's swooning. This is the second coming of the Messiah. They are lauded in every single corner of the country. The press isn't talking about the serious reports of rape, sexual assault, and vandalism taking place on Occupy Wall Street campgrounds. The press isn't reporting all the insane things that the occupiers believe and are spewing. Three months after the movement begins, President Barack Obama takes time out of his busy schedule to give a speech in Osawatomi, Kansas, in which he effectually gives his blessing to the Occupy Wall Street movement and says that this rhetoric of the 1% versus the 99%, he injects it into the national bloodstream. A year later, the Tea Party movement is dead as a doornail. By contrast, the Tea Party, seven years later, with this endless barrage of attacks, is still standing strong across the country, not just in South Carolina, in all 50 states. And that, to me, this energy that you've brought to our politics is fantastic. Now, there are questions that remain. Where I live in Washington, DC, which I think you can imagine is not a hotbed of Tea Party activism, People look at me and say, you're a Tea Party guy? I say, of course. And he said, well, what exactly do you guys believe? And I say, look, there's a very simple answer to that. The answer is, we want to go back to our founding principles. We want to rebuild limited constitutional government in America. We want to rein in the excesses of sprawling, intrusive, and costly government. That's the easy answer. But I didn't come here today to explain to you the easy answer. I want to focus with you on what does that mean in practice? Because if you look at the reality on the ground, this sounds like a crazy project. We have had a century of progressive liberalism in America. The administrative state is deeply entrenched. Our government in Washington, D.C., and for that matter, in the states, is completely out of whack with the Constitution. If the founders, and this gentleman is representing the founders, if I were to take you with me, and teach you an intro college class, we wouldn't read the Federalist Papers. I'd explain to you how the government actually works. And then I'd take you around Washington, D.C. and show you the buildings, the CFPP, the EPA. And then you'd say, oh, well, this is still America, because I recognize some of the geography. But you guys have amended the Constitution so much that it's practically a new one. Or maybe the Constitution we gave you, it failed. And you guys had another constitution, which is too bad. We thought ours was pretty good. But there is no way I can square what I'm seeing with the document that we gave you. Absolutely impossible. On the surface, you can. Sure, we still have a Congress. And it's made up of a House of Representatives and a Senate. We still have a president who only serves four-year terms. And federal judges need to be appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. But the structure of the government, how it operates, has been modified, transformed beyond recognition. The words on the paper are the same, but no one reads them in a way that would be recognizable to those who wrote them. You remember what Nancy Pelosi said when she was asked, where exactly in the Constitution does it say that the federal government can compel you to purchase health insurance? What was her answer? Are you serious? Are you serious? I got to tell you, in a sense, I can understand where she's coming from. Since when does Congress pay attention to the Constitution? When is the last time you had serious floor debates on the meaning of the Constitution? The government we have in Washington is completely out of whack with the Constitution. I'll give you a few examples. The Constitution makes quite clear that legislative power at the federal level is to be found in one place and one place only. Congress, Article 1, Section 1. 
All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States of America. What does Congress do with that legislative power today? It delegates it. It looks at the myriad agencies, bureaus, and departments, the alphabet soups of EPAs, CFPPs, EEOCs, and say, here, you go make regulations that, by the way, have the force of law. All I ask is that you kind of fairly regulate competition or keep the air clean, but you go figure it out. I'm pretty busy. The Constitution very clearly separates the executive, legislative, and judiciary powers. That's why there are three articles. That's why the Constitution does not speak of the federal government of the United States of America. It speaks of a Congress, a president, and courts. What's happening in the agencies today? They combine all three functions of government. Madison called this the very definition of tyranny. So the same bureaucrats who are writing the regulations are enforcing them. And when you're not happy that you're being sued and prosecuted by the EPA, you go before an EPA judge. They combine all three functions of the government. The Constitution, for example, last time I checked, creates a federated republic in which the states are given very, very wide latitude to enact policies that are tailored to the needs of their citizens. Basically, Congress can only do what the Constitution allows it to do, and the states can do whatever the Constitution doesn't forbid them from doing. Today, however, the states act and are treated as these administrative subunits of the federal government that are here to help implement national policy on every conceivable issue because nothing is off limits to the federal government. And lastly, if there's one principle that undergirds the entirety of the Constitution, it's the idea of the rule of law. It's the idea that in this country, we, including our elected officials, are governed and subject to laws. We don't just make it up as we go along. But what's going on in DC? They pass these statutes that are filled with carve-outs and special exemptions. Presidents selectively enforce laws based on which ones they like or they don't like. Bureaucrats implement regulations in a capricious and arbitrary manner. And then you turn to the courts, you see the most bizarre paradoxical combination of judicial activism and judicial passivity, allowing all of this to happen. So I return to my question. What does it mean for us, the Tea Party, in 2016 to say, we want to rebuild limited constitutional government in America? I raise the challenge not to induce you to despair. I raise the challenge to remind you that we need to do the very hard work of thinking through what our project is. And if I try to put myself in the shoes of the founders, I think that if they were to look at this situation, or for that matter, any other difficult situation, they would say, you need to do three things. The first thing you need to do is recognize the magnitude of the task before you. Second, once you've done that, you need to concretely, properly diagnose the problems. You can't cure problems if you don't understand the root cause. And third, you need to do the hard work of developing and implementing concrete strategies that advance the cause of liberty and scale back the size of the state. The founders were statesmen. They did their homework. They studied political theory. They studied history. They had practical political experience. They deliberated and thought hard. Look at what Washington did. Who did he surround himself by in his cabinet? Hamilton and Jefferson who basically didn't see eye to eye on anything except for the fact that Aaron Burr was a very bad man. <laughs> Aside from that, they didn't agree on everything. What did Washington do? He allowed them to go at it. He listened. He asked them to submit reports. And then he deliberated, and he picked what he thought was the best course of action. These are the three things we need to do. I'd like to go over them with you. The first one is key. We need to realize the magnitude of the task before us. We have had a century of progressive liberalism in America. The administrative state is deeply entrenched. We are not going to undo the damage that progressive liberalism has done to our country overnight. All of us are in this for the long haul. 
If it took a century to get here, you know what? Maybe it'll take a century to undo the damage that was done to our constitutional order. All of us are in this for the long hunt, the long haul. This isn't Star Wars. Remember how they blow up the Death Star? This enormous, huge Death Star? They fire one missile and the whole thing blows up? That's not the way it works. I wish it did, and that would make my life much easier. Now, I say that not to induce despair, because sometimes when you start thinking about it, you realize, you know, some things are not as difficult as they seem. As I mentioned to you, the progressives have done all of this, here's a little secret, without amending the Constitution formally. So Tea Partiers get pretty upset about the 17th Amendment. I really don't think it made all that much of a difference. To be quite honest with you, three quarters of the states already had the direct election of senators before the 17th Amendment, and nothing prevents the states today from flexing their muscles and compelling their senators to come testify before the state legislatures and say, why did you vote for this? Nothing prevents them from demanding more accountability for their senators. The 16th Amendment, I think, is a big difference. I mean, that kind of basically opens up the floodgates of federal spending. But with that exception, everything that the left has done and that the right has allowed to happen has been done without modifying the words on paper. Nothing in principle prevents us from interpreting the Constitution correctly. Our Constitution, on paper, if the founders were to look at it today, would say, yeah, this is it. It hasn't changed. Nothing in principle prevents the president, Congress, or the state from saying no to the Supreme Court when they issue these ridiculous decisions completely unmoored from the text of the Constitution. Why do they not rue it right now? Because it suits them. They're so happy to have the Supreme Court just take care of gay marriage so we don't need to deal with it anymore. They could. The, Supreme, the Constitution does not say that the Supreme Court shall settle definitively every last constitutional matter in this country. That wouldn't require a constitutional amendment. You know what it would require? A change in the way that we think. Judicial supremacy exists in spite of the Constitution, not because of it. Which brings me to my second point. Some of these problems aren't as, they don't, when you start looking into them, you realize that they're not as they present themselves. One of the things, if I have one criticism about the Tea Party, is sometimes when I travel and I listen to folks talk, I think, so basically, big government is just Washington, D.C. And D.C. caused it, and everyone else had to be dragged along, kicking and screaming, because we all hate big government. The people hate it, the states hate it, and, the cor and corporate America hates it. Really? So 50% of federal spending is entitlements, and the American people don't like Social Security and Medicare? The last time I checked, it was 70% of Americans who like Social Security and Medicare. The states love the Constitution? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. That's why they all said no to Medicaid expansion and no child left behind in Common Core. I, I remember very well now. And corporate America, as you know, I mean, they just love limited government. All of them were opposed to Obamacare. I mean, they never lobby for a higher minimum wage or more environmental regula regulations. Conservatives need to recognize that the problem of big government is not as simple as we make it out to be. There's a whole lot more appetite for it out there than simply liberals, welfare mooches, and the teachers unions. Many people have drank the Kool-Aid. The states are not as solid as you think they are. Some of them are. But many others are quite happy to receive the federal dollars in one pocket and then to say, look at all this spending in Washington, D.C. Well, I got to tell you, it's pretty easy to balance your budgets at the state level if, A, you don't have to deal with keeping the country safe and spending on the military, and B, if you have entirely offloaded to the federal government the responsibility of taking care of the poor and the elderly, which is, in effect, what they've done. Don't be fooled. The problems are more complicated than they see. There are many more actors, including people that you think, or, or actors like the states, that we have a tendency to view as these mythical unicorns of benevolence that just love the Constitution. Most of them have been thoroughly captured by the public sector unions. It is much more complicated than we think it is. The rot is not confined to Washington. If it were only confined to Washington, 
we would have solved it that much more easily. So what do we do then? And this is the note I want to end on. You don't just throw the Hail Mary. Okay, you don't rule it out, you keep it in your playbook. But what you focus on is the ground game and exploiting gaps in the defense. Three yards and a cloud of dust. You focus on doing the hard work of thinking through these problems, identifying the bottlenecks, and developing and implementing concrete, targeted solutions that make a difference. You don't just fall for silver bullet solutions that will solve all our problems overnight. If only we pass this amendment, if only we win this election, it'll all be done. This is not the way it works. Look at the homeschooling movement in America in the 1980s, what Mike Ferris did with the Homeschool Legal Defense Fund. He started all by himself, went to all 50 states, and one after the other, he fought to give Americans the right to take their kids out of these rotten public schools and to educate them the way they want. Today in America, we've got homeschooling in all 50 states. Two million children are being homeschooled. Look at what happened with school choice. You know who first had the idea of school choice? Milton Friedman in 1955, 60 years ago. And only now is it starting to bear fruit with, school, with vouchers, charter schools, and now education savings account that are the next big thing in, in the school choice movement. Look at the federal level with welfare reform in 1996. Ronald Reagan becomes governor of California in the 70s, and he realizes not a single federal welfare program has a work requirement. He starts talking about it. Policy experts start working on solutions. How exactly can you compel people to work while receiving welfare if they're capable of doing so? He gets elected to president. He talks about it nonstop. Congress does nothing, of course. It's controlled by the Democrats. Fast forward to 1996. Finally, it's signed into law after Clinton vetoed it twice. What you start to realize is none of these things individually, if I came up to you and talked to you about one of them, is going to save our country. But if you add them up, if we're all working, if you bring your energy, and one at a time we organize, we think we do our homework, think of what we can do. I'll leave you with a la last example that is dear to my heart. If there is one thing that Tea Party folks care about, it's spending is the reckless, out-of-control spending in Washington, D.C. that is bankrupting our country. But here's my question to you. Do we have a spending problem in America? I don't think so. I think we have an entitlement problem in America. It's not foreign aid that's bankrupting our country. It's not aid to Togo. Foreign aid is 1% of, of, of the federal budget. It's not waste and fraud. It's not duplicative programs. You know what swallows 50% of federal spending and is the fastest growing category? The entitlements. Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. And Congress doesn't appropriate them. That is mandatory spending. Now here's my question to you. Do we really have a spending problem or do we have an entitlement problem? Should we be talking about spending cuts in the abstract or should we be saying, hey, we need to fix the entitlements? If I came to you and I said, man, I'm spending 50% of my income gambling, and within 15 years, the entirety of my salary will be consumed at the casino, I think I've got a spending problem. What would you tell me? No, you don't. You've got a gambling problem. We don't have a spending problem in this country. We've got an entitlement problem. And I believe, and this is why I don't despair about America, that if you bring your energy to this, as you have been doing, and you keep the pressure on, you continue to do your homework, to hold politicians accountable, to not allow them to get away with the stupid talking points, to realize that we are in this for the long game, I don't see why we can't make a concrete difference. Just think of what you've done in seven years. Think of the counterfactual. Where would America be today without the Tea Party? How much of the Pelosi, Reid, Obama agenda would have been implemented had the Tea Party gone the way of the Occupy Wall Street movement? Obamacare would be the settled law of the land. We'd probably have cap and trade. I guarantee we would have had another round of stimulus because Paul Krugman said that the first one wasn't big enough with more shovel-ready projects and more high-speed rail. 
we probably would have had universal background checks on the way to gun control. None of this happened because of you. And for that, we should all be very grateful. Thank you.